Is ice a completely useless element? <laughs> Let me introduce you to Cloud Strife, Eco Mercenary, Ex Soldier, Planet Savior, and, uh, Disney Princess? What the heck? Can you beat Final Fantasy VII with only ice damage? In battle, the only damaging skills we may choose are those of the ice element, but any damage that enemies deal to each other or themselves is fair game. We're playing solo, meaning only the player character may perform actions in battle, while all others must waste their turns with defend. No summons, and finally, no glitches, hacks, mods, or cheats. Let's do it. We name ourselves Easy Freezy, and are immediately thrown into a mission to blow up a macro reactor that is sucking life juice from the planet. Ice can deal damage to these enemies, unlike some later bosses, meaning we can take them out with no issues. Going into the menu to put everyone on the back row is also a great idea. It means we deal and receive significantly less melee damage, and since we're magic only, there is no downside to doing this. We crack an ether before pushing into the Guard Scorpion boss fight. We only have one spare ether now, so I'm praying that we'll have enough MP to make it through. The fight itself is pretty straightforward. It does counter-attack with Tail Laser when hit with its stinger up, but we have plenty of potions to keep our health topped up, and after just 3 minutes, we hit it with a final ice for 44 damage, wiping it out. That's 100 XP in the bag. After a frantic escape, the reactor explodes and we're on the run. There are some optional battles against the enemy Shinra troops here, but we make our escape atop this very well-timed passing train. After listening to some rather painful sound effects, we catch this man doing, uh, <laughs> yeah, what exactly was that? <laughs> and arrive at the Sector 7 slums. After discussing how much we miss the Shinra, we combine an all materia from the beginner's hall with our ice, meaning its first use each turn will target, well, all enemies instead of just one. Nice. This lets us deal massive damage, often wiping out an entire mob in one turn. Wow. We spend a fair bit of time grinding in this section of the train graveyard, using the kids nearby in to restore MP when needed. This gets us a few level ups ready for Reactor 5. The enemies here are quite a bit beefier, but they're nothing we can't handle, so we push onto the game's second main story boss, Air Buster. While the fight plays out, let's take a minute to talk about elemental damage in this game. For those unaware, every enemy in FF7 has weaknesses and resistances to different elements, with some even being able to fully absorb your damage and turn it into healing. We chose ice because it is arguably the worst element in the entire game. Not only are there way more regular enemies that resist ice compared to those weak to it, but there are also a fair few bosses that are completely immune to ice damage, some of which are optional side content, but many of them are not. So tactically utilising the game's mechanics against it will be crucial to beating this run. With Airbuster defeated, we fall down into the Sector 5 slums where we meet this kind flower girl. Uh, what, what was her name again? Hmm. Let's see here. No, we'll stick with... Uh, oh, actually... Ah, sod it. <laughs> After chucking some barrels down to help Aerith... We push through this god-awful maze and have a fight with a literal house. <laughs> oh god, I love this game. And mosey on into Wall Market. We investigate some very shady goings-on at the Honey Bee Inn. Oh dear. And we head on over to the <coughs> room for a bit of... Uh, <laughs> what is going on in this game? <laughs> With Cloud all dressed up, we have an uncomfortable run-in with the local sleazebag Don Corneo, and get dropped into the sewers. The boss here, Apps, is incredibly tanky, but most of his attacks are kinda weak, so he's down in just over a minute, and we hit level 13. So far, so good. Nothing much to report from the sewers or the subsequent train graveyard section, so I'll save your time. Our next task is to make it to the top of the Sector 7 pillar to stop Shinra from collapsing it and dropping the giant plate onto the citizens below. Most enemies here can't be one shot, so making it up the pillar takes quite a while, but thankfully the Reno fight is nice and easy because he only uses his annoying pyramid thingies on Tifa and Barrett, leaving us to get repeatedly stun-rodded before he runs off. 
with the plate dropped and Aerith kidnapped by Shinra Turks, things are not looking good for our spiky-haired hero. After more cutscenes discussing the Shinra, we grab ourselves some double A's and get climbing. We brought the fight right to Shinra's headquarters, but the enemies here are a complete joke. The red ones that ambush you in the lift slash elevator are a bit more tanky, but having clouds sitting in the back row is definitely paying off. We solve the weird library puzzle for an elemental materia, which may come in handy at some point, and are soon thrown into a fight against the crazy Professor Hojo's experimental monster, which is called... Uh, uh, let me check here... H0512. <laughs> Alongside its little yellow H0512 opt buddies, this thing is shockingly powerful and aggressive. Both of our allies are poisoned and soon succumb. It's just Cloud left and he's critically low, at one point dropping to just 2 HP, yikes! The potion spam is going nowhere, but thankfully Cure is much more effective, the downside being that it eats into our extremely limited pool of MP. We ignore the yellow guys and just push the offensive with the main monster. Come on. Yes, alright, that's one talisman in the bag. After following a creepy blood trail, we find out that the president of Shinra is dead. Oh no! So while Cloud explores the rooftop balcony for story reasons, we're left in charge of Aerith. We make sure she's properly geared out with a mithril armlet plus talisman and materia moved over from Cloud's setup. Boss fight time, let's go! It's immediately obvious that bosses in this game are getting stronger now, with 100 Gunner here being able to consistently deal strong amounts of damage. Then, when it switches over to Heli Gunner, it deals even more damage! We keep queuing up ice spells, but Firing Line poisons us and puts us to sleep. That means that by the time we wake up, we have very little time to react and we're soon down to a sea cannon. Ouch! That was our first game over of the run, but luckily we did save the game fairly recently. Second attempt and phase 1 is pretty much the same as before, so we'll fast forward a bit. The heli gunner is just as powerful as before and gets some crazy good luck inflicting status ailments, meaning Barrett and Red 13 are dead in seconds, leaving Aerith alone to face the music. From there though, I'm not sure if it was good RNG or just the game taking pity on us, but the enemy mostly just stopped using its strongest moves for some reason, and we could therefore give it a jolly good thwacking. It's down in just a couple more minutes, very nice. The game now gives us the opportunity to magically teleport gear back over to Cloud for the Rufus Shinra boss fight. He's accompanied by his Dark Nation Cat Panther thingy, but neither of them are particularly strong, and it's over in just a single minute. With our mission complete, it's time to make a badass escape aboard this awesome looking motorbike. We move everyone to the front row, you'll see why in a minute, and begin our escape. But let's make this extra fun. Since we're doing ice only, Cloud is not allowed to swing his sword here. This means our only option for protecting the truck is to body block the thing and have the enemies collide with us, leading to what can only be described as some, uh, <laughs> Rather unsafe road usage. <laughs> Once we make it to the end though, we get rear attacked by this motorball boss, which is exactly why we swapped the order because our front row is now the back row. <laughs> this means that although our two allies get wiped out as usual, Cloud can play a battle of endurance to eventually secure the win. Alright. That means we've managed to make it to the outskirts of Midgar with not a single BS Arbiter of Fate Ghost mm. in sight. <laughs> We're forced to keep three party members throughout the game, so we ditch the girls and stick with our bros. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you all. <laughs> We're in the wide open world of Gaia now, and our first pit stop is the calm village of, well, calm. <laughs> After casually ransacking innocent people's homes, we sit through some flashbacks, including this one with Sephiroth, where we can just defend while the AI automatically does its thing. There's a lot of exposition and flashbacks here, but I'm not going to talk too much about this game's storyline because I know there's going to be people watching who haven't played the game before, and I think the story is best experienced firsthand. I don't want to be the one who spoils anything, so for now we'll just say that this Sephiroth guy is evil and we have to stop him. 
We grab the PHS to allow us to switch party members at any time, check out the latest episode of Strictly Come Dancing, or Dancing with the Stars for the American viewers, avoid a giant snake, defeat some tough mobs in the Mithril Mine that take way too long to beat, grab our first permanent stat boosting item, a mine source, which we immediately use on Cloud, and arrive in the Junon area. Fort Condor offers very little for now, so instead we grab optional party member Yuffie and push on into June on itself. Nothing interesting to be had at the shop, so let's try fighting the next boss, Bottom Swell. This monster is a giant flying Gyarados thingy with one very annoying move. Check this out. Yep, this bubble traps you inside while constantly draining your HP. In any normal run, we could just pop the bubble with another party member and be on our merry way. But here we are solo, and therefore if Cloud gets hit by the thing, it's GG. Game over. Second attempt and things are going better until... Uh, yep, it happens again. We tried this fight on repeat for almost half an hour, but it's just not happening. There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. The plan is to farm enemies until we're strong enough to be able to defeat the bottom swell before it has any chance to bubble cloud. The grind takes a long time, but we eventually gain enough AP for our ice materia to upgrade, granting us access to a new spell conveniently named Ice 2. This spell uses up a lot more MP, but we're now hitting for triple the amount of damage, let's go! It takes less than a single minute to wipe the thing out and we hit level 23. We're awarded with the Shiva Materia, which we can equip for the passive stat buff, but a reminder that using summons is banned by the rules. We push on to Upper Junon, do an absolutely awful job of staying in line while disguised as Shinra Infantry, meet a very, uh, strange looking dog, and set off on a journey across the ocean. It's here that we're forced into a battle against Genova Birth, a 4000 HP tank with some nasty attacks. We're immediately stopped and double tail lizard before we've even had a chance to perform an action. We keep spamming Ice 2 and thankfully her second stop fails to connect. We have to play aggressively and select actions quickly because Genova may not seem very strong, but she's fast and all of these chips of damage are quickly adding up, not to mention those status ailments that have the potential to get very nasty. Somehow though, we come out on top. I think all of that grinding back in Junon really paid off there. The ferry arrives at the beautiful resort of Costa del Sol, but we ain't got time for sunbathing, oh no. We're making a beeline for North Coral while defeating all of these weird floating golden egg and fiery bomb enemies along the way. The residents of this charming little village like Cloud so much that they don't want him to leave. <laughs> let me out! Please, just let me go! From here we can access the Gold Saucer, a really fun area that's packed full of side content. We're not doing any of that right now though, because we're just here for... Catchy. Only to be quickly thrown into the prison below. After being stalked by a creepy laughing guy, we swap everything across to Barrett for his mandatory 1v1 against ex-buddy Dine. Barrett's magic stat isn't very good, but luckily Dine only has 1200 HP, so it's basically impossible to lose this one. Our group may have been convicted of mass murder, but a single win at the Chocobo races is all it takes to get a full pardon and receive a buggy in compensation. <laughs> Now that we can cross rivers, we push on into the optional Gongaga area for the sake of completion. There's a battle here against Reno and Rude who do put up a tough fight, so we focus down the lower level of the two Turks until he retreats. <laughs> I love how Rude just checks his watch at the end there, like, nah, I ain't staying for this crap. <laughs> After learning about big, large, huge materia and dangerously reaching into an exploded reactor for a bit of shiny shiny, the party pushes on through the seemingly endless battles to the infamous Cosmo Canyon. There are some excellent stat boosting materia on sale here, but sadly we can only afford a single HP plus for now. After a chat with Grandfather Bugenhagen, we're treated to what was for the time an absolutely stunning cutscene and head down into the Cave of the Gi. Surprisingly, this area was quite tough. Every time you touch one of these spider webs, you're forced into a battle against a giant arachnid, which can deal massive damage with Sting Bomb. Wait, let's see that again. 
Damn, these things are strong. <laughs> Here's our setup going into the Gein Attack boss fight. We're level 26 and have a nice range of materia, passively buffing our stats. Let's go. Gein Attack is arguably the strongest boss we've faced so far. It has a whopping 5,500 HP, can drain our MP, and can summon these annoying soul fires seemingly infinitely. Annoyingly, this boss can be very easily killed by using restorative items on it with something like Phoenix Down or Elixir being able to one-shot the thing, but of course that's not an option for our friend Easy for Easy here. It takes a lot of items, patience and perseverance to take this one down, with a battle that took more than five minutes, and that's with the speed up function. Whew! I'm really hoping that guy isn't a sign of things to come. <laughs> With the buggy repaired, the Avenger can continue onto Cloud's home of Nibelheim. Here some cloaked guys bribe us into buying the Crisis Core remake. Must go to Reunion! We meet a very rude woman who won't even speak before opening the shop menu. <laughs> like, come on, I've seen better customer service on TripAdvisor. And meet a dog who makes a weird whining noise whenever you interact with it. Okay, I'm done. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> more stat boosting items, more Sephiroth being Sephiroth, and it's time to crack this safe to fight the optional lost number boss so we can recruit Vincent. But oh boy, this thing is one tough cookie. At a whopping level 35, it has 7,000 health, hits very hard and fast, and has access to various magic spells. Needless to say, we get absolutely obliterated. We didn't even get it halfway. Second attempt, and we somehow managed to get as far as its second phase, but at this point it heavily raises its magic defense, and again, we get absolutely obliterated. There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. Bruh, Vincent is optional, so you should have just left this boss for later, dislike and subscribe. Yeah, but where's the fun in that? Much better to spend an entire Saturday farming levels while listening to YouTube in the background. <laughs> We're back at level 37 and here's our setup going in. Alright, let's crack this thing. The fight begins and we spam our shiny new Ice 3 ability for massive damage, forcing it onto phase 2 within a matter of seconds. Nice! Again, phase 2 is tough, but we're still dealing around 350 damage per use instead of the earlier 90. Red 13 falls and Barrett is close behind. We keep using Aethers, but its Aspil skill keeps heavily draining our MP. Oh, sod it, we elixir up and finish the thing off. Job done. With Vincent recruited, we can finally push on up Mount Nibble and onto the Materia Keeper boss. This thing has just over 8,000 health, while each of our Ice 3 spells is hitting for about 1,200, so yeah, this doesn't take very long. That's one, um, gem ring in the bag. Our next destination is the Rocket Town called, well, Rocket Town. <laughs> What's that? It's, it's a rocket cloud. It, it's in the name, for God's sake. We can purchase ethers here, which is nice, and meet up with Sid, who is, well, heh, not the most charming person in the world. Wow, some of this game's dialogue really didn't age well. Palmer's here guarding the tiny Bronco, but as always, he's a complete joke, so we nab his plane and get the hell out of there. Until... ah, oh well, uh, heh, that was uh, less than ideal. <laughs> The game opens up a lot more now, so we're heading to Wutai for the optional storyline there. There's just one problem. Yep, Yuffie steals all of our materia, meaning we no longer have access to ice spells and therefore we literally can't do anything against these soldiers. The problem is that for this run, we must complete the optional Wutai side content, you'll see why in a minute, so we have to get past these soldiers somehow. Thankfully, I have a solution. Betting on chocobo races is the only method of obtaining ice damaging items in the game without using morph. The problem is that it's very random. If you're not in a race yourself then the colours of the chocobos are purely cosmetic and because you can only select three tiles at a time we have a 20% chance of winning a prize on any given race. 
if we do win, about half the time there are no ice crystals or Antarctic winds up for grabs anyway, so the race is worthless. But even if we do win and there's an ice item up for grabs, it's normally in the rare slot, of which there are only 3 of 15. So if my maths is correct, that means on any given race, there is a 1 in 50 or 2% chance of giving us an ice item. Needless to say, we were here for an entire evening and only bagged a handful. I think Wu Tai is going to have to wait for now. While we're here though, we do a round in the battle arena to grab the keystone, which we'll need in a minute, and spend some quality bro time with Barrett. Yep, I spent a bloody long time using guides to pick optimal dialogue options, just so you could all spend a few seconds seeing Barrett in a cable car. <laughs> anyway, after being double crossed by... Catchy. We head back to Wutai to give this another shot. We're armed with six ice crystals, and after we finish sleeping on the job, two ice crystals wipe out this annoying duo, and we head on into the city itself. There are lots of free items to be had here, but while chasing Yuffie around the city, we must be very careful not to overwrite our original save file until we get those materia back, otherwise this entire run would be dead in the water. This entire optional section concludes with a 6000 HP boss wraps. Our remaining ice crystals are barely scratching the thing and it's hitting hard, meaning we're dead in seconds. The second attempt goes better, but we just don't have enough ice dealing damaging items, so we'll have to reload our last save file and continue with the main story for now. Okay, where were we? Ah oh, yes, betrayed by Kachi and heading into the Temple of the Ancients. It's a bit of a maze in here, but the item rewards are fantastic. Just don't talk to me about this boulder section. <laughs> oh my god, I'm actually too ashamed to talk about how long that part took me to get through. <laughs> At the clock section, we grab a ribbon, which will be very handy, have a lovely chinwag with this nice chap who wants to destroy the entire planet and become a god or something. <laughs> I mean, everyone has to have a hobby, right? And it's time for the Red Dragon boss, who took a whopping 41 seconds to take down. <laughs> that makes it the fastest and easiest boss so far, which is surprising because the dragon armlet that it drops is a fantastic piece of armour that holds 6 materia and halves incoming elemental damage, but we're not done yet. Demon's Gate is up next, and after that FF12 challenge run we did, you can understand why I'm always super nervous about demons that are also walls. The first attempt went on for quite a while, but we got greedy by using an ether when we should have gone for healing, and got punished for it. Ouch! Attempt number 2, and we try to utilise Big Guard, an enemy skill that we learned which buffs our defence, magic defence, and grants haste for a limited time. Then, after 4 minutes of spamming Ice 3, it finally falls. Job done. After waking up in Gongaga, we sprint through Bone Village and the Sleeping Forest to arrive at the City of the Ancients. And damn, those visual effects look gorgeous. I mean, come on, this was PS1 era and they were pulling this off. Very nice. We push on in, but we're only here for two things. Firstly, to enjoy a nice shish kebab, and secondly, to take down Genova 2 Electric Boogaloo. This thing is a whopping level 50 with 10,000 HP, but we did remember to equip the water ring before the fight, leading to most of its attacks being completely ineffective. The thing eventually runs out of MP, and we put it out of its misery with a final Ice 3. That means we can let Aerith have her little swimming session, and we're at the end of Disc 1. Time so far, 18 and a half hours. Not too shabby. There are some great items on the way out of here, including this Magic Plus Materia, which boosts our magical damage output by 10%, and after we get it upgraded, by 50%. Very nice. We push through Ice Glen and make a complete fool of ourselves snowboarding down this hill. You know what, no matter how many times I play this game, I just cannot do this snowboarding section properly. Like, <laughs> honestly, does anyone have any advice? Like, I really would appreciate some help with this. <laughs> oh, God. There's an optional snow mini boss enemy in the next area who drains ice damage and is immune to basically everything, including instant death. But she's optional, and if you lose to her, then you don't receive a game over, so we just steal her circlet accessory and deliberately defeat ourselves to move on. 
After discovering that lightly jogging on the spot raises body temperature faster than climbing a vertical cliff, it finally happens. The Run Killer. Shizo here is a mandatory two-headed dragon boss with an interesting mechanic. Let's see here, the right head spits out fire while absorbing fire damage, whereas the left head spits out ice damage while absorbing ice damage. Wait, what? Yep, that's right. We can take down the right head no problem, but we cannot inflict any damage on the left head. We can't even manipulate the right head into attacking the left because both heads are immune to manipulation. The only way I could think to get past this boss was to equip a counter-attack materia, then use ethers on the enemy so it never runs out of MP. This way, Cloud's AI will automatically strike back without the player needing to select any non-ice commands. It still feels like cheating though, but since both Shizo heads are basically immune to all status ailments, including instant death, it's the only way we can progress. We'll talk more about this fight at the end though. With that, we finally arrived at the North Crater. It's here that we have to dodge some annoying wind blasts and take on Genova Death, who has a whopping 25,000 HP and high magical defense. It's a very slow fight and our first attempt ends very badly as we get silenced with no way to cleanse it, so we're just waiting for death. We switch up our accessory to equip the ribbon that we grabbed back at the Temple of the Ancients, meaning we'll now take more fire damage but cannot be afflicted with any status ailments. This means that the fight is a lot more balanced, we just have to keep a close eye on our health pool as she loves to spam red lights several times per turn. She's down after 4 minutes. After more spoilery spoilery cutscenes, we escape aboard the High Wind and become prisoners in Junon. I'm just glad the guards are negligent enough to let us use the save point completely unsupervised. <laughs> Things get pretty crazy here. We have Kachi leading the party for a short time, Junon's sister Ray Cannon blasting a sapphire weapon, Tifa has to escape a gas chamber and have a slapping match with Scarlet, but it's all okay because we escape aboard the High Wind. We now have access to the best vehicle in the game, and... Wait, ever notice how the music in this game just randomly cuts out sometimes? <laughs> yeah, this isn't me silencing the clip, this is actually what it's like in game, and it's kinda creepy. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that was loud! Cloud is MIA right now, so let's see if we can beat the Wutai subplot without him. As always, Yuffie steals our materia, but check this out. Yeah, for some reason, she didn't steal all of our materia. So does that mean that there's a limit to how many materia she can actually steal? Well, I'm not complaining because the stars have aligned and we've been left with ice. So after chasing Yuffie around Wutai, we can finally try fighting Raps again. Attempt 1. Hmm, dead. Attempt 2. Hmm, better, but still dead. <laughs> we try equipping the circlet for attempt number 3 and it does help a bit, but yep, yeah, eh, still dead. Attempt 4, and honestly this run was nothing but pure luck. The enemy seems docile and rarely uses its most powerful moves, leading to victory in just over one minute. Thank god that's over with, but why did we even need to complete the Wutai subplot I hear you asking? Was it for the peace ring, or the stat boosting item rewards, or something else entirely? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you later. You serious? For now, we need to pop to Medeal to check on Cloud. When Sid takes over as party leader, we grab the Curse Ring and give this white chocobo a Mimid Green in exchange for the Contain Materia. This grants us access to the insanely powerful Freeze ability, which is the best ice spell in the entire game. It seems like you can't make it target all enemies though, so we'll just have to keep our old Ice 3 handy for when we need to wipe out entire mobs more quickly without burning through quite as much MP. Anyway, what's Sid up to? Well, firstly he's saving the day by beating up monsters atop a runaway train and then randomly yanking levers to stop it crashing into a populated village. And for his next trick, he's protecting Fort Condor from a CMD Grand Horn so that a giant baby chicken can be born. Then he's repelling the advances of Ultima Weapon to protect the citizens of a third settlement. Ha! <laughs> All in a day's work. But after the events of Cloud and Tifa being temporarily dropped into the live stream for some spoilery spoilery story time, we awake back at the surface and everyone is back aboard the High Wind with Cloud leading the pack. We'll be exclusively playing as Cloud from this point on, which should make things easier to follow. 
Nothing much to report in the underwater Junon section of the game, the regular enemies are super weak as is the carry armour who steals Barrett for a bit of spin to win but it doesn't pay off and it goes down in just a couple of minutes. The submarine section was as always jolly good fun. Hey, whatever happened to mini games anyway, pretty much every big game in the PS1, PS2 era was packed full of them, but since then we just don't get them in games anymore. Hmm, shame really, they're, they're a nice change of pace. Okay, submarine unlocked, so let's go and see what's down here. Holy Jesus! Yeah, we are not fighting that. <laughs> Yet. Instead, we grab the huge materia from the sunken sub and whoa, he has teleported. Okay, alright everybody, just stay calm. Ah! Aboard the optional sunken Gelnica aircraft, there's another optional boss fight against Reno and Rude. And yes, we do have to take them both out this time. Thankfully, we just to say manage it with free spam before running out of MP. It's also worth noting that enemies aboard the Gelnica give huge amounts of XP and AP, so it's a great place to farm, providing you bring enough tents so that you don't have to keep making the super long trip to the nearest inn. Back in Rocket Town, we're forced into another fight against Rude, who is, for some reason, now at a lower level than when we last saw him, and is therefore a complete joke. <laughs> That means we can fly off into outer space, grab the huge materia using the code that we totally didn't grab off Google, hop into an escape pod, complete some spoilery story events with Grandfather Bugenhagen back at the Forgotten Capital, and it's time to take on Diamond Weapon. Whoa, alright, calm down. <laughs> Thanks to HP Pluses, Cloud is now at the maximum of 9999 HP, with his MP close behind. Diamond Weapon is massive and appears very intimidating, but with only 30,000 HP, our freezes are hitting hard and it's over before it could really begin. This overpowered freeze spell absolutely carried us through the later sections of the game, including working our way through Midgar. But that's when this happens. Yep, the Turks are back, joined by new member Elena, who absorbs all ice damage, much like the left Chizo head from earlier. Does that mean we're going to have a second run fail? Well, thankfully not, because this time there's a workaround. Because we completed that horrific Wutai subplot and saved her life, we're rewarded by being given the option to skip this fight entirely. Nice. Boss rush time, and first up is Heidegger and Scarlet aboard the Proud Clod Mech. This thing boasts 60,000 HP, double that of Diamond Weapon, but much like Diamond Weapon, it's a complete joke. Its attacks are slow and barely do any damage, so it's just a bullet sponge that goes down in three and a half minutes. Next up is Hojo, who has gone completely mad, like Dr. Embryo mad. We switch to Ice 3 when his two minions come out for that glorious AoE splash damage and we're soon on to Phase 2. This part is a bit more faffy due to all the different limb targets, meaning it's kind of difficult to tell what you're even aiming at. We eventually swap back across to Freeze and just keep spamming while he fails to connect his status ailments and we're soon on to the final phase, which I assume is representing that he's dead and coming back to attack us as a ghost thing? <laughs> I don't know. But what I do know is that this ribbon is saving us from his silences, while his combos are really quite terrible. A couple of ethers later, and that's 25,000 XP in the bag. It was nice knowing you, Hojo. With that, we jet off straight onto Disc 3. Before we head to Sephiroth at the North Crater, though, it's time to mop up some side content. Emerald weapon completely drains ice damage and even if it didn't, it's able to completely wipe us out in a matter of seconds. Ultima weapon however is a bit more palatable and has low enough magical defence for us to hit for 9999. Now that's what I call massive damage. Hey get back here you git. We make sure we grab all the items in the ancient forest and the north crater including backtracking after the party splits up. We may never use this stuff, who knows, but it's good to have. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to head down these rocks for the final boss of the game. Here's our setup going in. We're level 77 with arguably the best gear in the game, and here's a quick flick through our materia for those who are interested. Let's rock. 
We start by going up against Genova Synthesis, and this is where we have to trick the game a little bit. You see, there's a hidden mechanic at play here. We must allow Genova to have at least 13 turns before dealing 45,000 damage to her, and therefore triggering her countdown. Why? Well, this forces us to go into the Sephiroth fight as a solo party, which is absolutely essential if we want to succeed with Ice only. So we let her have her fun before using freezers to trigger her Ultima ability, ending the fight. Aw, oh, poor Barrett. Sephiroth's first phase, Bizarro, consists of five parts. A head, which just respawns if you defeat it, a left magic wing, a right magic wing that completely absorbs ice damage, a core and a main body. Normally you'd be forced to destroy both magic wings, including the one that absorbs ice, before being able to deal with Sephiroth himself. But since we dragged out that Genova fight to go in as a solo party, we're able to attack his body directly. But he's still healing way faster than we can damage him, even with a haste buff from Big Guard. We try going in with a ribbon instead to prevent his slows, but it's the same deal. We come back at a whopping level 80, and after many more failed attempts, we finally have this run. Again, we stall out Genova Synthesis long enough to trigger a solo party and for both of our teammates to fall. This is a solo run after all. Against Bizarro Sephiroth, we start by dodging his various crap while spamming AoE ice skills to wipe out his left magic and temporarily his head. From there, he's healing for about 6,500 per turn, whereas we're inflicting around 9,700 per turn, meaning we are finally making a bit of progress here. Having magic counter on an Ice 3 materia is also handy for dealing that little bit of extra damage, though our high evasion from speed plus materias is actually saving us from being hit most of the time anyway. Five minutes later, we dodge his powerful Stigma ability, and two freezes later, he is down. Nice. On to his final phase, Safer Sephiroth, who has 150,000 HP. We kick things off with a big guard and wall respectively before the onslaught can begin. It's incredibly important during this phase to never lock in an action too soon, especially if it's an attack because Sephiroth's most powerful attacks often get priority, and you don't want to be knocked down to critical HP only to have Cloud use a queued attack instead of an item. Add in the fact that some of Sephiroth's skills have an incredibly long animation and it can be tough to keep track. Basically, we only choose an ice command when we know it is entirely safe to do so. Some of his attacks, like his infamous supernova, take almost an entire minute to play out, and that's the sped up version. This thing deals massive damage and it's a great idea to chug an elixir immediately after this move gets used. With Big Guard up, we notice him wasting a turn by doing his little float up and down animation, meaning it's safe to slot a freeze in here. I'll be honest, my heart was racing for this entire fight. I think the fact that the latest save point was an hour ago really adds to the tension, unlike most modern games that allow you to save right up until the boss door. We keep healing even though we're only missing a couple of thousand HP because we really don't want to get one shot out of the blue. Before long, he uses yet another supernova. Again, we counter it with an ice 3 before using an X potion to top ourselves up. By the way, you can watch the full length regular speed footage of this boss fight over on our Patreon page, thanks to all these fantastic people who are already supporting the channel. After almost 15 minutes, we throw a final freeze at Sephiroth, finishing the run. All that's left is a scripted story event, and Big Baddie Sephiroth has finally been defeated. Can you beat Final Fantasy VII with only ice damage without party members, summons, cheats, or glitches? Well, mostly yes, we just have to figure out how to beat that left cheese or head. Hmm, any ideas? As always, feel free to leave your challenge run ideas and requests down below. Please click all the things so that YouTube recommends the video to more people, and I'll see you later everyone. Cheers.